Thank you, Mrs. Spry, and for that wonderful special. All for Jesus. It ought to characterize our life, shouldn't it? Uh, let's dismiss our King's kids uh, this evening. And they're off to a great start. Excited about King's kids. Wow, it's a bunch of them. Amen. Looking at the campers on the screen there, I was looking at the perspiration on them and the red cheeks reminded me how hot it is at <laughs> camp. And the uh, slaughters have been there a time or two. You know how warm it gets. And we're excited about this summer and just what the Lord will do in their lives. And thank you for giving uh, to that. And uh, trust you'll continue to uh, be faithful in those areas. And uh, just want to say thank you to Pastor Ingram for allowing uh, me and others to have the opportunity to preach. And it's an honor. And so let's, uh, let's dive in. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. I'd like to preach to you tonight on contentment, this thought of contentment. I believe we could say it's a biblical virtue among many, but as we preach about contentment, we also have to address covetousness, and so we'll be looking at both of those. So let's stand together in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. The Bible tells us, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, tonight and being able to be in church, and Lord, for the opportunity to preach. And we pray you'd help us tonight uh, truly learn what contentment is, but Lord, how we can... Uh, stay in victory in this area, and Lord, not give uh, place to the devil, not give place to uh, wrong desires, but that we would truly uh, find contentment in where you have us in life, uh, where you have us uh, in our status, or where you have us in geographically, even in this place of Newton County, Covington, Georgia, the United States of America. I pray, Lord, that we would see all things that you've done in our lives as your sovereign grace and your, your act of providence uh, to see that your kingdom goes forward and that you receive all the glory and the honor and praise that's due unto your name. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And please be seated. So it's interesting that Paul gives Timothy this instruction that but godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, Jesus also instructed his disciples. He told them, he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so as we think about this, this uh, virtue, this truth of contentment, uh, what is contentment? Uh, Strong defines this as a condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. Uh, another definition could be of contentment, a sufficiency of the necessities of life. I like that one, sufficiency of the necessities of life. A third definition could be, and I like this one too, a mind contented with its lot. And then it uses the word contentment to define contentment. But those two, sufficiency of the necessities of life and a mind that is contented with its lot in life. You'd be surprised at a number of people who are just, not even to say they're not happy, they're just not content with the way things are in their, their life. And they may look at it and say, it wasn't my choosing, and there were circumstances outside of my control. And although in some regards that 
is, is truthful, but also for the Christian, you know, we must remember that uh, God is the supreme potentate. He, he, is, he is Lord over our lives, and there's nothing in our lives that has happened uh, by accident. He has, he has orchestrated my life and your life for the divine purpose to bring Him glory. That, that, that is our ultimate end in life. And, and we can be guilty of, of failing to recognize what mission we're truly on in life. Adrian Rogers, a Baptist preacher, once said, Contentment is an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace despite outward circumstances. Contentment is inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace despite outward circumstances. I first want to look at a couple of illustrations in the Bible that are, are really are, may first seem to be on the extreme, but when we break it down to uh, just some smaller, or we look at it kind of with a microscope, we'll see where these illustrations, two of these had a, had a tragic evil end, but you can also understand how it happened. And so the first one, and you don't have to turn there if you just want to listen, we'll be turning more, but in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, we have the uh, account where Nathan the prophet has uh, confronted David with his, his sin. And if we look at verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. And let me pause here. So, so Nathan is coming to King David, and he's, he's giving a story, a parable, to help paint the picture and to, to draw out David into recognizing what he has done and, and the sin that he has committed and how, it is, how tragic it is. So it's verse 2, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, and the poor man, the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. So there's two men. There's a rich man and there's a poor man. One has much, another does not. He has little. And so, verse 4, And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come. So the rich man has a visitor, a traveler. He has many sheep he could pull from and slaughter and prepare a meal. But he doesn't take out of his abundance. He goes over to the one who has little to nothing and takes his and slaughters that lamb which was precious to the poor man and uses that to serve his, his, his wayfaring man, the, the visitor. You can see already, this ain't right. This is unjust. And David, and look at verse 5. So let's look at David's reaction. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And in some famous words in our, our text, verse 7, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. I want you to look down to verse 8. And Nathan is continuing to talk, and he says, So he's speaking on behalf of God. These are God's words coming through the prophet Nathan. In verse 8 he says, I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little... I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. So in this illustration, what, what can we learn from this situation? Uh, verse 8 really begins to tell us uh, where David got his focus off. And although we don't see this, uh, in, 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 I guess, in, in words in the Bible, uh, David was growing dissatisfied. He was not content with where God had placed him and given him. In one commentator said, in God's providence, he had given David, the king of Israel, everything that had belonged to King Saul. Everything. Um, in fact, Nathan, in a sense, rehearses to David what God had done. We, although we don't read it in Scripture, he, by him telling, if that had not been enough, such and such things would I have given you. Let's look briefly at what King David had. He was anointed king even when King Saul was still reigning. God had preserved David. 
He'd also preserve the kingdom for David. He gave David power over the house of Saul. Uh, Israel, as a nation, under King's, King David's rule, was a master over many other nations. And he not only ruled over Israel, he also had Judah. The entire wealth of the whole kingdom was at David's disposal. All he had to do was say a word, and he could have whatever he wanted. People were willing to oblige this great king. And as if that wasn't enough, as it says in verse 8, God was willing and ready to bestow upon him even more. So Nathan, as he rehearses this story, or tells the story to David, he's really telling David, he says, can't you see how great God is to you, how good he is to you, how liberal he's been to you, and he wants to give you more. It is ungrateful, and it is gross discontent for anyone to covet what God has prohibited. You know, David, really, if he was, um, out of, if he was uh, missing something, he had the liberty to pray to God and, and ask for it. But he didn't. He saw and he took. The arch enemy to contentment is covetousness. Covetousness completely destroys. Our second example is another one you're familiar with in 1 Kings chapter 21. Remember King Ahaz and Naboth's vineyard? We know the story there in verse 21, uh, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab said unto Naboth, saying, Give me the vineyard, that I, that I may have it for a garden of, her, of herbs, because it is near, near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. You know what Ahab does? After this, he goes and he faces a wall and he pouts. Ahab, uh, King, um, King Ahab, I said Ahaz, it's King Ahab. Sorry about that. Uh, now I'm going to say Ahaz the rest of the time. <laughs> King Ahab was discontent. Interesting thing about this particular illustration is that we see uh, this sin is in itself its own punishment. King Ahab was tormented because he couldn't have what he wanted. He desired something that was not his. He couldn't have it. And now his spirit is saddened. His physical body begins to show signs of some illness or something's wrong. And any enjoyment that he may have wanted to have was now sour. Being discontent makes our hearts heavy, causes the bones to rot. And may we understand that this type of attitude begins nowhere else but in our mind, in the way we think, in the way we view our life. The Apostle Paul, we read about him talking, uh, writing to Timothy. Paul found contentment in a prison cell. King Ahab, he's in the palace. And when he went to bed that night, he went to bed a poor man. Because he wasn't satisfied with what he had. He too, like King David, he had all the delights of the land. He had all the wealth of the kingdom at his disposal. He had all the power that comes with being a king and sitting on the throne. Yet, he was poor. He wanted something he couldn't have. You know, sinful desires will expose a man to continual annoyances. No matter how much that they possess to make themselves happy, they will always find something that makes them sad. And they'll always be fretting, always be anxious, always be worried. And the truth of these illustrations, we find that as King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 5.10, he says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. So no matter what these men desired, even if they got it, it still wasn't going to satisfy because they were coveting what was not theirs to have. Solomon is telling us that those who make their personal goal, their ambition, their drive to possess wealth, to, to gain possessions, to have notoriety or reputation or even status, it, it, they, they end up at the same destination. They're left wanting. 
Another good quote from Adrian Rogers is this. A discontented man is never rich. A man who has contentment is always rich. Someone who is not content with what he has will not be content with what he would have. To whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. As I said earlier, the arch enemy to contentment is covetousness. It completely destroys. Covetousness or, or being discontented. Uh, really, I, I, I may use these interchangeably, but I know they're, they're different, but it's almost as if one is married to the other. Being discontented, coveting that which we do not um, should have or coveting what belongs to somebody else or being discontented with life and where we are leads us many times to idolatry because because what will happen is we'll we'll become we'll have a dissatisfied spirit and we'll begin to only desire the the, the wealth the possessions above desiring God and anything that we place above God is idolatry in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the last commandment, I believe it kind of incorporates all the commandments that govern us in our relationship with people. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Why is that important? Those things don't belong to us. They belong to somebody else. And see, this idea of covetousness, it starts from within us. It's that which is already in there. I heard an illustration where if you, if you have an, an, a piece of fruit and it looks like a worm has left a hole in there, um, you don't have to worry. Uh, that insect is not inside the fruit. He's eaten his way out. But it was when that fruit was in the blossom that that egg probably was planted and it's been inside the heart of that fruit. That's many times the way we are. And Jesus taught this in Mark chapter 7. He said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Sadly, uh, we're not content by nature. The, the covetousness, the, the natural bent to wanting what someone else has uh, can, can assail all of us. Paul wrote in Ephesians, he was reminding us, he says, of, of in times past, how we fulfilled the lust of the flesh, how we were wanting to fulfill our desires, how we were wanting to, to covet that which is not ours, where we were discontent with what we had. He says this in Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And just so if we think that heaven is the, or uh, earth is the only place where we see um, this sin or this problem, you know, heaven was no stranger to covetousness. Heaven was no stranger to someone being jealous for that which somebody else had. Jesus uh, preached in John chapter 8. He was talking to the Pharisees. He says, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there is no truth in him. And then later we're reminded in Isaiah chapter 14, this is a picture in heaven. Lucifer's words were these, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And then it's reminded, too, of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Perfect place. God gave everything to his two children. They possessed everything. But one thing was off limits. And Satan was crafty that he got Eve to take her eyes off of all that she possessed. 
It happened to David. It happened to King Ahab. It happens to us. All the goodness of God was right there in the Garden of Eden. And then when God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. It's sad. It's sad that God is liberal with his gifts. And he's so good to us. He takes care of us. The only reason we think we're left wanting is simply we've been duped to believe that we're going to miss out on something. We're duped to believe that God's not been good. We didn't get the promotion that we thought we'd get. That bonus wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. I didn't get hired at that job. My, uh, my family's not what I th- I'm not where I thought I would be when I was casting my vision, setting my goals for my family. I'm just not quite measuring up, not quite there. And oftentimes we fall into the trap of comparing ourselves one to another. As the children of God, if we say, I'm not content with, or, or if we're encouraging one another to be satisfied with our lot in life, not lot as in all the stuff I got, but where I am in life, uh, being content with where I am geographically in Covington, Georgia, Newton County, United States of America, being content right here where God has us, being content with the, the job that God's allowed you to have, being content with the house God's allowed you to have, being, being content with the, the cars you drive and the, 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 the paychecks and, and, and whether, you're, uh, whether we're satisfied with the amount of pay or it's not enough, uh, listen, uh, uh, hopefully for most of us, the paycheck's coming in. I realize people struggle and have different circumstances. And it's not to say that we're sticking our heads in the sand or that we're trying to uh, just speak emotional talk or motivate ourselves when times are hard. No, this is really taking a hard look and, and asking ourselves, Am I truly content? Am I truly satisfied with all that God has bestowed upon me as his child? Because the moment we begin to believe just as King David did and King Ahab and Eve, getting our eyes off of all what we really possess in an earthly sense. And really, we're just talking about the earthly. We haven't even begun to talk about all of the spiritual blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, The fact that you and I, if we know the Lord, will never, never spend one heartbeat in a place called hell. We'll never, ever, ever be separated from God's love, God's presence, God's relationship. We'll We'll never be separated from the Father. Why? Because Jesus Christ took on a brief separation from His Father, from our Father, the God of heaven, when he bore the sins, our sins, that day on Calvary, when the sky turned dark, for the first time, the Trinity was separated. He endured that pain and suffering and being alone for us so that we would never be alone ever again. That's just one, one item on the list. There are many. So how do we cultivate this heart of contentment and defeat covetousness? How, how do we do this? What, what, is our, what is our steps? Well, first, we're going to get to three action steps at, at, the, at the end here. But let's look together. If you would, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 4 with me. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, familiar book and, and passage to us. Philippians chapter 4. Paul gives us, uh, Paul gives us some great, great truth, more than just good advice. But when we look at the life of Paul, I was thinking... Um, of, of just uh, men who had been under uh, grave adversity and, and just seemed to rise above uh, what they were experiencing and, and keeping the, the, the bright outlook, keeping things in perspective. And uh, Paul does, uh, the life of Paul is so, so powerful. But let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 and look at what he writes. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, Notice the next words, for I have learned, I've learned. 
in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. In verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed. I'm, I'm taught both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This next verse, having looked at the first two, gives me a whole new perspective on 413. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's not the, that's not the verse for the basketball player. And I love watching sports. And uh, I don't know if y'all know, Miss Angela Castle's grandson is now, uh, he's got a, a NCAA championship ring as a freshman in college, playing for the UConn Huskies. I don't know if, if y'all remember uh, the family when we uh, uh, had the memorial for Miss Angela Castle. Um, great, great young athlete. Um, but this verse is not, I mean, I guess athletes can use it, but Paul is telling us, hey, listen, to be content with what God is doing in your life, we have to learn. Dr. Child said today, he says, as is everything in the Christian life, after salvation, when you're born again and the newness of life sets in, we have to learn and sometimes relearn how to live the honorable life that God wants us to live. He's saying, I have... I've been taught, God has taught me how to be content. I've learned, I've been instructed that I can, I, that no matter when I have a lot in my life, when I have nothing, I'm content with everything that God has placed in front of me. He says, I've, I've learned to live the not I, but Christ's life. And, and how does Paul, where does Paul come from? If you go to Romans chapter 7, you don't have to turn there. But in Romans chapter 7, he says this. Um, I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Wow. Paul, earlier known as Saul, when, when the Holy Spirit got a hold of his heart, uh, and, and when you look at the life of Paul, uh, if there was anyone that had grounds to, I guess, brag on the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual life, the where he had come from, where he had arrived to. I mean, we could say, Paul, you, you checked all the boxes. And, and that was not the Apostle Paul at all. But he says, the Lord convicted me of coveting, of not being content with what he's done in my life. And then he gives us the encouragement and says, hey, today in 2024, you, you can... You can have victory over being discontent. You can have victory over coveting. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He then tells Timothy, um, in fact, let's go back. I know we're uh, going back and forth, but let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 where we started. We'll probably stay there for, for the rest of the time we're here. But... Uh, as he's writing to Christians and then he's going back and talking, we're going back as he's talking to Timothy, he, uh, he's, he tells him in verse 6, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And you know what? It is. Being godly, married with contentment, hey, that's great gain for the, for the Christian. Th this is where true life happens. Godly people, they're content with what? God has uh, orchestrated in their life. And just thinking back when um, the pastor has preached to us about New Testament Christianity, I don't, I don't know if Dane LeBee could, could be uh, able to say content knowing that you're watching your family getting ready to be martyred. Uh, you're, you're watching your family being drug out to be burned at the stake or... or soaked in oil so that they can be a torch for the king on the road into the city. Because those were the... Th when Paul is talking about the Christians being content, that's what's on his heart and mind. It's not first world America and our first world problems is, you know, my, my bubble gum so minty it makes the cold water hurt my mouth. That, that, that's, not a, that's not a problem, folks, okay? That's just, you know, bad timing. I don't know. But that's not what he's talking about. The Christians were under great persecution, and they, they, they counted an honor. 
to preach with boldness and be beaten for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and so he's instructing Timothy in verse 6, but with godliness, with contentment, is great gain. And he says, uh, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. He's telling Timothy, we don't need to gather more stuff. Because when life is over on this earth, all that's going to stay here. We're not taking anything with us. And he encourages in, in verse 8, he says, And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And that narrows, the, uh, that narrows our shopping list for this week down to just a couple of items, right? What is Paul trying to tell us? He's saying, hey, godly people are content with clothes on their back, a full stomach, and a roof over their head. Everything else is laniap, a little something extra. It's just extra. It's just sauce on the top. But we're content with our clothes. We're content with our food and a roof over our head. And in verse 9, he tells him, he says, But they that will be rich fall into, tem- into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So craving for more earthly wealth and material possessions, and just say it causes a lot of grief and pain that God did not intend for us to experience. Having wealth is not a sin. Being wealthy is not wrong. We can go back and look at the Bible Job was a very wealthy man. So was Abraham. King Solomon, wealthiest man on the planet in his day. Um, King, King David may have come from a meager home, but God bestowed upon him great wealth with the entire kingdom. And so none of that is wrong. In fact, there's, there's plenty of uh, warnings for the rich people to keep their eyes and keep their mind really above the earthly. Uh, It's to keep your eyes focused above what you possess. God doesn't want you focused on what's here and now. He wants you focused on what's eternal. He wants us really to appropriate every blessing that the Christian life offers while we're living here. That's what he wants us to experience. If if we're going to drive hard to amass a a, a finish line or a, a goal for us, it ought to be, I want to experience all of the Christian life that God wants for me to experience today. And then he encourages them. He says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, and faith, love, and patience, and meekness. Pursue what brings life. That's what he's telling them. Flee, flee the earthly Pursue what brings life. And just thinking about possessions and, and wealth and, you know, and really in America, and I, I think I mentioned this to my Sunday school class, in America, even though we would feel like the economy is not what it should be or what it has been, you know, we're still a wealthy country. Uh, and... I know there's a lot of people coming in our country, and we could talk about all of that on some other occasion. But they, they come here for a reason, and that's because where they are, they're losing their homes. Their leaders are taking all of their money to increase their power. Uh, their basic necessities are not met. In fact, um, criminals come and exploit even, even our, our, our fair justice system because uh, we, we count life as precious. Uh, we uh, probably should be f- faster to, we should probably act quicker to, to end life in some cases, but we're, we're very slow to put to death even criminal activity. Uh, in some cases that shouldn't be, but I'm saying is we value people, we value life. We, we value people being able to, um, because of the, the truth from the Word of God that's been um, 
that was here long before you and I got here, the fact that people can come and, and work and, and do for themselves and provide for their families uh, really is, is a picture of what God has allowed to happen. And so I guess I say all that is we might be unhappy with present circumstances in our country, but it's far better than other places. We have a lot of freedoms here. And so it's not wrong for the children of God to possess wealth. In fact, thinking back to what Pastor Wayne Hardy preached some time ago, I think it was at the GIBF, maybe it was our missions conference. Hey, if we're, if we're blessed with money, yeah, we ought to give the missions. We ought to see to it that other places that maybe can't afford a missionary pastor to send him with, with the right money, the right amount of money to start a church in places where they're not hearing the gospel preached. Well, why can't Americans do that? Uh, the, the, the very dollars that we earn should go to help uh, see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. Uh, you and I may not be able to go, but we can take the, the blessings of the, the financial blessings that we have and, and work together uh, to, to see that that, that happens. And I, the more I think about that, I, I, I'm like, wow, thank you. Thank you, God, for putting me here. And, and thank you, God, for allowing me to participate that way. And thank you for letting me uh, uh, give generously to our church. And I'll mention this more. I guess I might as well mention it now since I'm talking about it. Generosity from God's people doesn't look the same for every one of us. But we will get cold and hard if we're tight-fisted with the good things that God has given us. Being content with what God has given us and seeing to it that we can bless other people. It's why it is... Being indebted to somebody and owing them something really cripples the Christian from participating in all that God wants them to do. Um, our, our, our academy started uh, a financial class for our seniors. And Mrs. Ingham's the teacher. She also has uh, supplemental videos. And the one thing that's really heartbreaking is to hear testimonies from people who are crying because they have amassed so much debt that they end up sleeping in their car, they can't pay their bills, they lose their house, or they're in, in danger of losing their house, and that's never what God intended. And you know what happens? Is when those situations in life hit us, we will do things that we never thought imaginable because of the stress and the anxiety. And there's a there's a biblical way for us to live with wealth. And, and just because someone doesn't have wealth doesn't mean God's forgotten them. Uh, if, if that's how we view possessions and status and things like that, we've, we've, really, missed, we've really missed everything that God is trying to teach us with this. And, and I think that's why Paul is urging Timothy on these matters of, of richness or wealth is because even in ministry, even where church leaders are there and church leaders need to have uh, some sort of sustenance, he's really warning Timothy in these, in these verses. He's telling him, he says, listen, you need to be focused on the things that bring you life, as, not, not just as a church leader, but as a, a disciple of Christ. He said, if you're going to fight for something, if you're going to lay hold of something, He's telling him in verse 12, he says, you need to fight the good fight of faith. If you're going to wage a fight, then fight for the faith. If you're going to lay hold onto something, lay hold to eternal life. Not, not salvation, but lay hold to experiencing God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he kind of finishes up the chapter in verse 17, or close to the end of the chapter, he says, charge them that are rich in this world. So here's, here's the exhortation to those that do have riches that they be not high-minded. Haughtiness. Don't, don't be haughty. Don't be high-minded. Nor trust in certain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. There's a threat. There's a threat to those who possess richness or riches in this world. They can begin to trust in their wealth, which that was never intended to replace their trust and the dependence upon God. And they can begin to see that their riches are the things that bring them joy. And, and Paul says, no, 
The only source of your possessions and the only source of your joy comes from one place. And that's God. So how to cultivate a heart of contentment and defeat covetousness. All right, we're going to turn to one more place. Turn with me to Psalm 128. Psalm 128 gives us a picture of contentment. In this picture of contentment, we're opening the front door of a house and we're going in and we're looking at daddy and mama and the kids and down the corridor of time, maybe even the grandchildren. And so let's look at Psalm chapter one or Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 128. No chapters there, just songs. <laughs> Verse one. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. You know what that word feareth means? It means to have an awe and respect and reverence and honor for God. He tells, he tells that everyone that, that has reverence and honors the Lord and makes this his manner of life, his walk in life, will be blessed. I added an, another psalm in here, a couple of verses that remind me, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way into the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So what's this first action step of the three? The first one is trust, trust in God. And I know that's a newsflash, but this is really what he's, he's telling us. In verse 1 of 128, he's saying those that, that respect God, walk in God, they're going to be blessed. And when you are receiving the blessings of God, uh, I believe desires are going to come in our heart to, to uh, give back to God, to serve God. And, and in that, I know you didn't turn there, but in that, in that Psalm 37 where he talks about delighting thyself in the Lord, that idea is, is, is happiness and joy and, and finding contentment in the Lord, but also has the idea of wherever the Lord is, wherever he's, wherever he's going, whatever he's doing, we're bending ourselves to that, that, that direction. We're bending ourselves. We're, we're lowering ourselves. or we're, we're going over here, and we're happy about it. Sometimes God leads us, and we ain't happy about it because that's not what we wanted to do. That's not the way we thought it would play out. But a person who delights in the Lord, no matter where the Lord is, no matter what he's doing, no matter what he's committing to us, we, we go. We bend ourselves in his direction, and we trust in him. And that idea of trust is to throw your cares onto another, throwing them, just chunking them. Here's all my cares, Lord, just throwing all of them. And he's not going to miss them. And my favorite part of being trusting is that the idea of trust is to never fear for your own self. Never fear that you're going to miss out on anything. There's no fear. You know God has this. God's not going to cut me short. He's not cutting corners in my life. He's not going to forget the jot and the tittle of my life. He is complete. He's complete in heaven, and he completes a perfect work in your life. Nothing is missed. And if there is something you think is missed, it might be that God doesn't want us to possess that or have that or experience, experience that. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning of your life. He knows the end of your life. He knows everything in between. He knows what's best for you better than we know ourselves. Amen. Delight. Trust. Trust in God. Get unshackled from covetousness. Put to death covetousness. So action step number one, trust in God. Number two, display your gratitude to God. Display your gratitude to God. So Psalm 128, verse 2, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be. Now, I don't know about you, but that tells us working is good. Working is a good thing with your hands. And it says you will be happy. And it talks about eating the labor. You know, it's, I like this part too. It's, it's good to take time off. It's good to find rest. It's good to take some of the hard-earned money or whatever it is you've earned and enjoy what enjoy your hard work. Uh, give gifts to the family. Take time with them. Eating the labor of thine hands. Not to be in excess, but that, he says you'll be happy. 
and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Now I know that in those verses it may not jump right out and say, well, I don't see how they're displaying gratitude to God. Those verses give us avenues in which we can display. Think, think of a man laboring. He can, sh- he can display his gratitude to God by just being thankful that, hey, God, you've given me a job. And, and there was a time I didn't have a job. Uh, you, you're able to provide for me. I'm displaying to those around me, I'm grateful for what you've done. His wife is fruitful. Hey, he's, he's thankful that, God, not only, can I, not only can I provide physically for my family, but I can provide spiritually for my family because I have a relationship with you. And it talks about the fruitful vine. Yes, it's talking about providing for the physical needs. But why is the wife fruitful? Why are the kids like, this is kind of interesting, they're like olive plants right around the table. He's just saying you're able to provide them. You're able to display your gratitude to God and be thankful for all that you can give your family. The physical needs are met. More importantly, the spiritual needs are met. They're able to enjoy fellowship. And and when he talks about in verse 4 that the man is blessed. Behold, that, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. What he's really giving us a picture is, is this man, having received blessings of God, is bending his knees. He's bending down. He's asking God to continue to bless him. Because he's been displaying his gratitude to God, he can continue to experience God's goodness and blessing in his life. Giving thanks unto the Father. Uh, have We know this one, giving thanks for this is the will of God. So that's number two, displaying your gratitude to God. And last one, number three, loving God, loving others, and giving generously. People plagued with covetousness, covetous people can't love other people. King Ahab wrapped up in self, King David could not love anyone because they were so in love with themselves at that particular moment. In verse 5, The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. So if we could summarize these two verses, what they're telling us is that we will receive what God has promised. God promises good to you. You will receive God's promise we will also receive what we have prayed for. And with these blessings, we can turn and bless others. We can love others. And we can give to others. Hey, do you know, as I mentioned earlier, our generosity, loving, our generosity to others doesn't look the same. It may be reminded that if we see God blessing someone and taking care of them, and it may seem that it outweighs us, can we just thank God for that? Thank God that, God, I'm glad you're good to them. I'm, I'm thankful that you're blessing them and that their blessing is not a loss to me because someone at that time is receiving what you might think or what I might think is an abundance. Hey, praise God. You have an abundance too. Another person's blessing is not your loss. God loves you and he loves them. So tonight our, our challenge is this. Do we want to cultivate the heart of contentment? Do we want to experience the inner peace despite our outward circumstances? Then we've got three steps we can take. We can trust God and throw all of our cares upon Him. We can display our gratitude to God and give Him all of our cares. And lastly, we can love God and love others. Displaying your gratitude to God is openly reminding ourselves and others of how God has been good to us. So if you would, let's stand tonight and